Um, so no, I think like uh, the, the potential for carbon markets, uh, I think Jennifer has covered, um, I think Emma has covered, so I will not bore you with that. Uh, since um, Jennifer broke the secret of uh, questions being shared in advance, so that was one of my questions. So I'm not going to bore you with that on how the global landscape of carbon market is. Uh, but Gareth, uh, I would say that um, um, it's not as gloomy as how you started. Actually, you made it very rosy in the end, saying that you are going to talk about challenges rather than opportunities. I agree with you, Emily, that uh, carbon markets are not a silver bullet solution for climate change problem. Uh, let's, uh, let's face that. And I know that because of the uh, one element within the Paris Agreement, which has a direct relationship with the private sector, you hear a lot about carbon market but that's just not the silver bullet solution. Maybe you might be wondering I'm, why I'm saying it, because my bread and uh, butter is earned out of carbon markets, mm -hmm. but still I'm saying this because I think for the global cause. Uh, and as from UNFCCC, I'm as e equally has to be inclusive. Um, so I think uh, I also agree that over a point of time, if we are all together committed what we have committed to Paris Agreement in 4.4 where uh, a particular paragraph where we all agreed that we will be moving towards an economy-wide NDC, the scope and the role of carbon markets will start diminishing, and we will be going towards a non-market-based approaches, which may happen in the mid-century. But now what we are talking about is what we will do between now until that middle century, uh, where uh, if I see as a global carbon market landscape, I think it's where we will be ending up at some point in time in 6.8, if we are all collectively committed to what has been inscribed in Paris. Um, and we will be taking some amount of sectors, and that's where I will jump into the African context. Uh, so to all of you, I wanted to say eight key areas or key outcomes that could be used by Africa or where Africa could benefit, uh, which where we have talked about challenges earlier from all of our colleagues in the panel. The first and foremost in the rules that you asked, Jennifer, is the scale neutrality. Right? So currently, like we talked about Cookstows, we talked about jurisdictional way of REDS uh, projects. So Article 6 comes with its rule of with full flexibility of scale agnostic. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine an activity at a facility level, community level, a sectoral level, a program level, or at a policy level. So there is no short of dearth of imagination of what your scale and size could be for you to do an activity in your country. If you're looking at large scale energy, transformation in a Southern African power pool and a Western African power pool, you have already started doing an economies of scale in terms of how this could then f further be used, I think is one of the things that you could think of. So first, my thing was scale neutrality. Second is type agnostic. I would say that's again beneficial for African continent is the type agnostic in terms of both emission reduction types and removal types. Right? So in, in the former KP world, we had uh, limitations on the types as well as on the scales, which you do not have in Article 6. So <laughs> always when there is a huge flexibility, the complexity comes behind it. So that's response to you that why we are taking more time uh, to produce the rules is because the, uh, it's kind of an open book. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that um, the things that are done are contributing to reduction of emissions, not to increase of emissions. So that's the second opportunity, I would say, from the African region. Number three, I think in the previous panel, we heard from some of our colleague about the suppressed demand uh, concept. Uh, from Kenya, from Annie, we listened to, I have 90% of renewable energy uh, that is in the grid. So what is my future, right? So there are two concepts that are embedded within the Article 6 rules, which again benefits African continent, is one in terms of looking at uh, the future anthropogenic emissions, right? So you are not looking at historical emissions mm -hmm. of what is currently happening. <laughs> but you are going to look at, in my long term, in my short term, long term, mid term, this is my scenario. And this is how I'm going to pro move forward. And within that scenario, what is your baseline? Reference level, the delta that you are talking about. That I would see as the third element for African continent mm -hmm. to look at in establishing baselines, which looks at not at historical level of emissions or current level of emissions, but look at the future anthropogenic emissions, taking into account your plans for your future expansion. Because we are all talking about, uh, I was in three days ago when the VIPs were discussing about energy transition, all the ministers with the 
COP presidents, uh, the incoming COP president designate, I clearly learned that only 1.29% of the energy investments happened on renewable energy came to sub-Saharan Africa, yeah. right? So you know that transformation is happening, but it is not happening. Why? I will come to the last on where we could do that. So I think the future of anthropogenic emissions. The fourth one, I think, uh, is the flexibility in operationalization uh, in terms of reduction of transaction costs, right? So there are three elements. Among the 50 African countries that we have, 50 plus African countries, we have 30 plus as least developed countries, if I'm not mistaken, right? So the rules gives the flexibility on two counts. One, you do not have an obligation, since you do not have an NDC kind of an obligation, mm -hmm. you have certain level of flexibility, number one. And then in the operational rules and modalities, we heard about transaction cost of under, under 